Recording in progress. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Thank you for joining this meeting. I see my a large number of uh, my fellow investigators. I see several of my former students, uh, and I see several enthusiasts joining. So welcome to all of you. We will get this going without uh, a long introduction. So I have uh, avoided an introduction to the speaker just to save some time and Many of you know me. I teach at IIT Madras. I see uh, several of my collaborators and co-workers on this call. I see Manfred Kappas and I see Tatsuya Tsukuda. I see several of my former students Thank you all for joining. Sugi, I see you. So thank you. This talk or a series of talks, we wanted to introduce the activities under a new initiative of the Institute called the Center of Excellence. And there are several such centers in the Institute. And uh, one of these is the Center on Molecular Materials and Functions. I thought uh, the best way to take such a, a science of a large number of people is to have a lecture series. And I'm starting that, but there are 17 lectures here. And all of these lectures are by very prominent people in this area. This month itself, we will have a lecture by my dear collaborator and a, a great experimentalist uh -huh. in this area, Professor Tatsuya Tsukura. And this will be followed. Uh, by several others, and I would like all of you to join this meeting wherever you are. Because in this uh, about 50-55 minutes of lectures followed by some 10 minutes of questions, we will be exposing this fascinating area of molecular materials and their associated functions in their own perspective. And that will certainly provide a greater uh, to the science that is being pursued. I would like all of you to mute and please check uh, whether your phone is or your microphone is muted. This subject of molecular materials, if you start looking at uh, materials and the changes in this area in the very uh, recent past, well, compared to the science of materials, if you look at that recent past, about 25 years or so, one important aspect that is obvious to everyone is the emergence of molecular matter. And that matter has many different 
dimensions, directions, fascinating subject areas. And they also have given, these materials have given several excitements. One such thing that obviously comes to one's mind is uh, fullerenes. But then the subject area has expanded. And today, one of the important fascinations in this area is centered around atomically precise clusters. Another subject area is uh, about hydrates. So today we will be looking at, uh, or this center is going to look at these two aspects, atomically precise clusters and hydrates with the kind of people or with, a, with a very interesting team of people. Although this doesn't represent this whole area because all area is expanding tremendously. Uh, we will certainly be showcasing the most important directions in this area. Uh, so that much uh, is the introduction. Let me get to what I wanted to talk to you today. Uh, I was planning to uh, present uh, to you a sort of a tour uh, of or tour into my activities at IIT Madras, focusing on clusters and hydrates. Hydrates to a very, very small extent. Most of it is going to be taken up by clusters. This subject itself has, as I said, expanded tremendously. And there are pioneering practitioners in this area, several of them. And we have written also extensively about this. Now, one thing that has come out in this subject area is that there is this increasing recognition that these are molecules. Now, atomically precise clusters are molecules. But you take any molecular material, uh, familiar one is water, there are a large number of molecular properties and I have not put all of them, many more properties. Uh, most of these are molecular in origin. Some of them you may relate it to uh, the bulk aspects of this material, uh, such as the velocity of sound or dielectric constant. But one thing is uh, obvious that there are a large number of fascinating properties. We don't know enough about uh, atomically precise clusters from this perspective, uh, but then that opens up a number of opportunities. What do we want to know? What are those properties? How do you explain those properties? I thought one way to show this molecular aspect of clusters is to explore their chemistry. And that is what we will be seeing in the course of this lecture. If you take one such cluster here, a cluster's mass spectrum is shown. The cluster is gold 25, ligand 18. Ligand is phenylethane thiol, 18, and the charge is one minus. And today we have a number of high quality mass spectrometers and extremely good ionization methods to take such clusters and put this into a machine and you get beautiful spectrum like this with uh, four decimal places, as you can see at 10,000 mass range. So that is a high resolution mass spectrum uh, that allows you to explore these properties of such clusters in great detail. So here, the molecular uh, ion 
gold 25, ligand 18, one minus is expanded, giving you the isotopic resolution, the peaks that you are supposed to be seeing. Gold itself has only one isotope, 197, but sulfur has four isotopes, 32, 33, 34, and 36. Carbon has isotopes, hydrogen has isotopes, and all of these together give you this beautiful distribution. There are many other peaks, but this is what you see uh, in the in spectrum in this intensity, uh, that uh, in this intensity range. Well, you have clusters, well-resolved synthesis, well, 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 I would say, uh, extremely pure uh, synthesis. And obviously, then you can crystallize it and you can get crystal structures. One thing that has happened is apart from such crystal structures, there's a lot of computing power that all of us have or institutions have and fantastic models with which we can understand the electronic structure and molecular properties in great detail. So this is the structure of gold 25 ligand 18, where the ligand is sort of a reduced ligand, SCH3, and that is what is shown here. And rest of these are gold atoms. Now, you have a number of other similar clusters. Uh, and an equivalent one is silver 25. Uh, and if you put the atomic diameter or radii uh, and redraw this uh, structure, this is like a piece of metal. Uh, and the dark, larger ones are uh, the gold or silver atoms. So you see a piece of this gold metal. You have a number of other uh, such clusters, as I just mentioned. One familiar one is uh, silver 44. This has several different types of uh, silvers, and they're all shown in different colors here. And starts with an icosahedral 12 atoms surrounded by 20 atoms of silver, surrounded by another 12 atoms that makes it to 44. But in this icosahedral, uh, this 12 atoms, there is no center atom, otherwise it would have been 13 atoms. So therefore this is similar to a molecule or fullerene. So this is a hollow cage cluster, uh, so-called. Now I said synthesis is there. So therefore you can get uh, crystals and these are beautiful crystals. Uh, what is shown here is uh, silver 29. One thing that we have been struggling with for quite some time was to image these crystals large crystals that you crystallize under a microscope, an electron microscope. This is because a high energy electron beam damages this, uh, aggregates, causes aggregation. But recently we have been in a position to see these crystal lattices with a regular, ordinary transmission electron microscope available anywhere. There are signs of aggregation, as you can see, but you see these lattice, uh, crystal lattice, very clearly. Now, you see atomically precise cluster crystal lattice. Sorry, I had to step out just to close the door. So you see atomically precise clusters, this crystal lattice, and you see specific lattice planes. Now, these are the lattice planes that you see as far as gold 29 ligand 18 is concerned. You can measure this for several seconds under this kind of a condition. 
then of course it starts aggregating, etc. So crystals are cluster lattices are there. Now, clusters are very good. You can measure this far spectrum, beautiful properties. So I asked you, or are, are I proposed uh, in this lecture, how do you look at this molecular properties to react chemistry? So most important chemistry that one can think about is the reactions between uh, molecules, here reactions between clusters. Can you show that clusters react just like molecules? Now, obviously participation of clusters in reactions is a subject matter that people have looked at. Uh, familiar thing is catalysis. Molecular reactions happen on nanoparticles or clusters of supported nanoparticles. This would be something that is sort of, sort of familiar. But we are talking about chemical reactions between clusters. So here is a cluster, here is another cluster. We are asking this question, can we have a chemical reaction of this kind where you get a product C and D from these clusters? If you were to ask that question, obviously if you get a result from this, you have associated thermodynamics, you have associated kinetics, you have dynamics, and that is all molecular. And this is one way to understand the properties of such cluster systems and classify whether they are molecular or not. So we measured the mass spectrum of this cluster and this cluster mixed together in solution. And at that point in time, this was a MALDI spectrum, matrix-assisted laser desorption ionization mass spectrum. And if you measure the mass spectrum of just this cluster, you get one peak and another peak. This peak is gold 25 FTP is this thiol, 18, one minus. And this peak is AU4 FTP4 loss from this and giving you AU21 FTP14 minus. If you mix this now, just after mixing, you see another peak, another peak. You get a series of peaks and the difference between these peaks is the mass difference between gold and silver. So the composition of this cluster, cluster series that you see is this. Correspondingly, you have these fragments also. This is just after a few minutes of mixing. You wait for some time, you see this, this intensity going down and a little later on, this peak will disappear completely and another set of peaks would appear. Now, this is not the end of the story. This cluster also shows corresponding changes. And so you have a series of chemical reactions wherein one gold is going into the silver cluster. Correspondingly, a silver is atom or ion is coming into the gold. So we don't know what is getting transferred. Finally, one silver is going in to gold cluster, another silver is going, or, or gold is going from gold cluster to the silver cluster. And this process goes on and you get an equilibrium composition corresponding to a given initial cluster mixture. So you ask this question, which of these atoms or ions is moving? Now, for that, you can go ahead and ask what is really possible. Here is gold cluster. 
and I have removed this alkyl or aryl chain. And then you have the silver cluster. So as far as the gold is concerned, there are three different types of gold in this. There is a central gold, an icosahedral gold, or a staple gold. In this, you have four different types of silver. There's an icosahedral silver, there is a dodecahedral vertex silver, and a dodecahedral facial silver, and the staple. Now, you can do computations. Now, as without even computation, one would say that if you take gold and put silver into that, here is gold and put silver into that, the energy is going to be positive because silver is less noble and it doesn't, this cluster system wouldn't like silver to get in to make it less noble. Now, on the other hand, if you take silver 44 and put gold into it, whether you put it into the I or DCV or DCF or S position, everything is going to be negative. But if you do a chemical reaction such that you get this and the starting from gold 25 and silver 44, you get a different kind of results depending upon where you put this gold and where you put the silver. So let us say we put in this particular case, silver is put at the central position and gold is put in the icosahedral position. So that way you have created this molecule called AU24AG1 and AG43AU1. Now you see that if you do that chemical reaction, the icosahedral position is negative, but these are all positive. Now, if I do, let us say, I position and then I position, that's again more negative, in fact. Others are, well, this is positive and others are negative. But some and substance of this is that I for I substitution is far more preferred than other substitution reactions. The chemistry is driven by enthalpy in the system. So one can go on, but when you go to larger cluster, let us say larger exchanges, you have isomeric combinations in the system. So computations become more involved. Then immediately we started looking at another chemistry. How about this reaction instead of 44, H44? And that was quite surprising. So if I take gold 44, uh, I'm sorry, gold 25 and silver 25, take an equimolar mixture, this intensity is smaller than this intensity. This ionization is far more preferred. And if you mix this, these peaks come up and we know what these peaks are. But if you mix this, you also see and expand this, these regions, you see that there are many other peaks and a whole lot of exchanges happen. And somehow some of these intensities are far more than other intensities. It appeared that this is because of an entropic contribution. Earlier I was talking to you about enthalpic contribution and greater entropic contributions giving you these peaks. Now, if at all these cluster reactions happen, this cluster A and this cluster B should come together and form an AB. Do you have this AB? Well, just after two minutes of mixing, this is what you see. And this is in fact an AB two minus, and you see, the corresponding mass separation in the mass spectrum. So therefore we thought that this is what the peak is and many other peaks are forming just from this. He went on, of course, investigating this chemistry further and further. Computationally, they do come together, clusters come together at distances wherein atom exchange is possible. So, 
you are probably doing this exchange through such dimers. Although only one dimer was detected at that point in time. Now chemistry allows you to change compositions. So here is silver 25 and add gold 25 to a little bit and you get a, an equilibrium. And this is what you see after an hour or two. You can add more gold 25 and equilibrium gets shifted and further shifted. And in fact, it is possible that you can keep changing or keep exchanging and move this system all the way there. It is not that all of these silver 25, obviously silver cannot be converted to gold, but obviously you have other products that are there as precipitates and, and fragments in the system. But it is possible that one atom exchange is possible all the way. How do you understand such things? Which of these atoms are changing? Uh, when you start writing a chemical equation, obviously you have a way to write these atom changes by a kind of a nomenclature. Can we have a nomenclature for a cluster system? You have these clusters, and when you say one atom is changing, atom can be changing here or there or there or there. You must have a way to name them. And we thought about this in great detail. And here is a nomenclature that we introduced. So if you look at this cluster system, there are three rings. There is an icosahedral 13 atom core. And then there is a ring, which is red. And then there is a blue ring. And then there is a green ring. All of them are perpendicular to each other. The small changes, but perpendicular to each other. Using this kind of a, a ring structure, uh, we created this nomenclature system starting from a central atom. You have 12 atoms surrounding this, and I so we can label these atoms here just as labeled here. I do not have time to go into these details more, but to say one, two, three, four atoms, let us say, if you take and then five, six, seven, eight. And then we have nine, 10, 11, 12. This makes it to 13 atom structure. But these one and two atoms here is connected with a staple group of S, A, U, S, A, U, S, which is S, A, U, S, A, U, S here. Now there is uh, three and four connected this way. Five and six connected that way, seven and eight connected that way, nine and 10 connected that way, 11 and 12 connected that way, gets you a structure. This structure is to say that there are rings in this cluster system. And if rings are present in this cluster system, obviously one and four is more tightly bound than other gold connections, like let us say, connection between five and 11, for example, or let us say two and 11, this two and 11, which are here two and 11. These bonds are in fact, a slightly longer than these one, four bonds. So it appears that these bonds are really, or these rings are really present, which allows these cluster systems to open and close very fast. And that is why chemical reactions are becoming so fast. Now, this structural insight is obvious from that ring in ring model called the Borromean model. This is one such three ring structure. This is common in Eastern philosophy. And that is a chemical bond. If you break this chemical bond now, this ring will come out and all these two other rings will come out too. So one ring, one chemical bond breaks this structure completely. And that assembly and disassembly of this could be the reason for these clusters to get formed. And we call this the aspicule nomenclature. Aspis is shield and cules come from molecules, shielded molecules. 
So these are actually shielded molecules. Now, what does this get you? Well, if you simply write a formula like this, it is possible to draw the structure. Look at this, D1 and D2 positions, or let us say D1 and D3, this kind of staples, we have a third position, we have, let us say, a molecule PET, and rest of these are, let us say, uh, SME or methane thiol. I can simply write this formula as D13, D23, di 2 phenylethane methyl thiolate or whatever this AU25 aspicule, or simplified D13, D23, PET2, PET2, SME16, AU25 aspicule 1 minus could be nearly an IUPAC name of this cluster. I can, with that label, I can draw this structure. That drawing the structure allows me to make a particular kind of chemical interaction between this cluster and another cluster and say which chemical bond is opening and which is closing and what is the kind of dimer that gets formed. So this kind of a nomenclature allows me to simplify chemistry happening in this cluster system. It is not just gold 25 alone, you can go to 102, gold 102, this is one of the well-known cluster systems or others. Now, these cluster systems allow you also to bring in optical chirality in the system, whether it is an R structure or a L structure. So I told you that clusters are coming together and you do have the possibility of dimers. Can you see these dimers? The mass spectrometry allows you to see cluster dimers uh, and they in fact occur in solution. Gold 25, if you measure in the mass spectrum, you do see the dimer of it. You also see the trimer of it. And you can do fragmentation or mobility and several such studies and prove that. In case you have an A and B and performing alloys, in fact, I showed you alloys, but these alloys can also give you unusual alloys which are otherwise not known. So here is one such alloy that can be made starting from an iridium cluster and gold 25. Chemistry can be done in solution with appropriate ligands. So here is a cluster, here is another cluster. You can bind it with some dithiol here, and you create a particular kind of reaction where in specific sites, sulfur or, or the ligand is exchanged, producing this dimer. Now, you, we have not been in a position to crystallize it, but the optical absorption spectrum confirms that essentially these features are that of the dimer. And you see the dimer as well in the in the mass spectrum. So the subject matter of atomically precise clusters react, reacting to give you uh, well-defined alloys and these kinds of chemical reactions showing that these cluster systems are molecules, that's quite exciting. But while I told you that there is one dimer that we have detected, but there is a possibility that many others are possible. Professor Manfred Kapp is in this group here and his team studied this in great detail and showed that here is a cluster, here is another cluster I told you about, and that is a dimer in the beginning of the reaction and give you these atom exchanges. But the end of these, or as the reaction proceeds, you start getting a large number of other dimers as well. You see that in between 
each one of these peaks, which are atom exchange peaks, you also see dimers. So these are dimers, whereas these are atom exchange products, MN products, let us say this is AU12, AG13, and this peak is AU11. Oh no, this is AG11, AU14. And the dimer here is falling in between that. So what you are seeing is chemical reactions keep producing a large number of intermediates and they keep disappearing in the solution. And greater and greater exchanges happen. You have dimers and you give you it, they give you products. Then these guys also produce uh, dimers and essentially the system equilibrates to some condition like this where monomers and dimers coexist. What the study has shown is that you have gold, silver 25, its concentration decreases as a function of reaction time. You have a product that gets formed, let us say, AG24AU1, that is here, its concentration goes up and decreases. That's because it is interacting further and gives you something and it decreases, decreases, goes up and decreases. And finally, it comes to some kind of an equilibrium as the previous graph has shown. So you see a series of chemical equations fantastic example of a consecutive chemical reaction. So while this is happening, this is beautiful, you ask this question, that's about AU25 and AG25, but AU25 itself is seeing another AU25, and that AU, one atom from one cluster can go to the next cluster, so that cluster can come back to this cluster. This is the dynamics that can happen in solution. Now, what is the best way to study this? Best way to study this is to take a silver cluster where you have an isotopically labeled silver. Let us say silver 109 and another cluster, which is silver 107. And if you show that there is atom exchange that is happening, then by mixing these two clusters, immediately after mixing, you should see an isotopically mixed cluster. And this is what we saw in this rapid isotopic exchange. So we produce this cluster with 107 silver having a mass number like this, 5142 is a peak that you can see here. And this is another cluster, 109 cluster. The difference will be 50 mass units. It is 5192. And you mix these two. These are two separate solutions that we have. And Papri did this uh, very interesting experiment. Here is this cluster. Here is the other cluster, 107 and 109. You mix these two, this disappears completely. This also disappears completely. And what you get is a 50-50 mixture of these, similar to H2O and D2O, mixing and giving you HDO. But she was in a position to measure this. The first mass spectrum could be collected in 15 seconds of mixing. 20 seconds, 25 seconds, and 30 seconds, this whole thing is gone. Such a fast, extremely interesting atom exchange tells you that they are indeed molecular systems. Can you do this, study the dynamics, uh, the, the rate of chemical, let us say, this exchange? Mass spec was, well, it, it took quite some time as far as uh, in this particular case, because the time taken is only 30, 30 seconds. We don't have enough mass spectral data uh, to get good 
uh, rate constants. But here we did this experiment with uh, 29. And this exchange could be studied over a long time and it took quite some time to equilibrate. But we saw that the initial exchange is quite fast. And in fact, there are three different rate constants that you see. And we interpret this as the first exchange as due to the surface atom exchange. And then there is the surface to interior, this kind of uh, transfer. And then there is an equilibration that happens. You have three different rate constants that you see. And overall, this kind of chemistry is comparable to the exchange chemistry that you see in other molecular systems. That, asks, that makes you ask this very interesting question. Can you take a cluster like this, an alloy, and make this atom tunnel or transfer into another cluster? We have not been in a position to do this yet, but it makes you ask this interesting questions. You can do, chemistry can be then expanded, for example, uh, ESMA studied very many such chemistry or reactions wherein you do A cluster react with B cluster, so you get an alloy. And this alloy is then reacted with another cluster or another ion, you make a trimetallic cluster or a tetrametallic or pentametallic. So you can expand this chemistry to a number of clusters. It is possible that you can have one cluster reacting with another cluster, giving you a third cluster. So this is not alloys now, silver A with silver B cluster reacting with silver, another silver C cluster. Now it is possible to expand such chemistry. When you do this thing, you find that you have a lot of variety. One thing we found was this cluster and this cluster, they both have similar external structure. So this cluster and this cluster, the difference between this is the six atoms. So these six atoms, in fact, go into this cavity of this. So as a result, the outer structure or the ligand structure is the same in all of these. As a result, they crystallize together, forming co-crystals. So in solution, they have, you can see these two things coexisting, but you get only one crystal. That is because they co-crystallize. Now, one can study many reactions, but where will it stop? Can clusters react with nanoparticles? So we found that polydispersed nanoparticles upon reaction with clusters, you get a solution which is highly monodispersed and you create super lattice structures. And this happens because these clusters contribute well to etching of atoms from these polydispersed uh, nanoparticles and make them monodispersed. And you can detect, let us say here is gold cluster, it is added to gold 25, added to silver nanoparticle. You see one silver atom being picked up by this guy. And in that process, you create these cluster uh, monodispersed and nanoparticles and several polydispersed particles of one diameter or another diameter can be taken. And you can prove that even if it is highly monodispersed, you can create uh, polydispersed, you can create monodispersed particles. And these crystals, well, super lattice, as I told you, they are not very big, but you can image it to find that there is uh, a translational periodicity in these uh, assemblies that you have. Reactions don't stop just there, A and B. There are supramolecular reactions. Uh, these clusters are negatively charged. And C60 likes negative charges. So we can create uh, a DEX of this kind. 
And in some cases, well, in this particular case, we can study the shift uh, in the NMR chemical shift of this particular system. So there's a free C60 and bound C, uh, C60 bound to this cluster, you have a, a different chemical shift. And they are all the same telling you that all C60 sitting on this cluster uh, in fact, there are four C60 sitting on this. They are all at equivalent positions, etc. Another interesting aspect is isomerism in these cluster systems. So here is a cluster, and this is called BDT, benzene, let us say, dithiol. It's a dithiol. And two of them are sitting on this silver 29 surface close by. You can put a cyclodextrin on it. In fact, six of them can be put. And that covers the surface completely because there are 12 BDTs present. But if you take, let us say this adapt, it has only one isomer. Whereas this two has two isomers, three has two isomers, four has two, five, there is no isomer, six, there is no isomer. And that is because you have the structural possibility in the system. For example, for ex you take these two isomer, this is a cartoon representation. Uh, these two CDs that are present on this cluster can be having this transposition or the cis position. So that allows you, uh, well, that gives you this possibility of creating such clusters. And this is what you see, cluster adex. Uh, that tells you that you can create superstructures and the superstructures of the cyclodextrins or crown ether or any such system can be crystallized. It's also possible that on plasmonic nanoparticles, you can assemble clusters and give you beautiful structures of this kind and they can be imaged. So you can create atomically precise cluster systems in many, many different ways and uh, their organization, assembly, and properties, they're all fascinating. So new materials are, can be produced. So I told you that from these molecular systems with, with such molecular properties, well, that uh, we know about, we can expand these molecular properties uh, even more. We know today a molecular formula, we, we have a weight, we have a structure, we have absorption, we have reactions, we have assembly, we have co-crystals, but many, many other things we don't know. We don't know phase transitions, we don't know phase properties, we don't know electrical and magnetic properties enough, we don't have mechanical properties enough, but Sugi has done something and I am not in a position to tell you about this for want of time. A lot more properties uh, can be discovered. In the next few minutes, I will show you several new excitements that are happening in the lab with new ligands. With Thomas Bayes and uh, Sundar Gopal Ghosh, uh, we create clusters. So these are carborane thiols. These are carboranes, uh, C2B10 systems connected to a thiol. Uh, you create clusters of this kind. A beautiful mass spectrum. Crystals are very big. And some of you who are in this audience would like to explore their properties. And uh, now these are now 1.4 millimeter big uh, crystals uh, and beautiful structures as I just mentioned. It appears as though that this is chiral, but it is not uh, because both the orientations, whether there is a right-handed orientation of these uh, carboranes as well as left-handed orientation, they coexist. Well, you can create larger nanoparticles. Yeah. Today, mass spectrometers, you can, you, with mass spectrometers of, let us say, things like charge detection mass spectrometry, you can go to megadaltons. So nothing prevents you from measuring the mass spectrum of a nanoparticle. Now, we have in got to nanoparticles yet, but we can measure mass spectrum of these. 
So in this, uh, Suraj is measuring mass spectra of clusters of this kind, extremely high quality mass spectra with precise, precise masses and their, um, their uh, transmission electron microscopy and such other things. It's not just gold and silver, the periodic table is very big. So here is another cluster system and uh, crystal structures can be solved. There are also this huge variety. So here is titanium dioxide in cluster form. And in the group, uh, we study mass spectra of such cluster systems and we find that titanium oxide, this cluster systems dissociate just like fullerenes. TiO2 losses, systematic losses, and the cluster as a whole fragments, uh, finally. Having come to the end of this cluster story, let me tell you one or two things very exciting. So we have been studying gas hydrates uh, with Rajneesh Kumar. We detected methane hydrate even at 22 Kelvin carbon dioxide hydrate, even at 10 Kelvin. Very interesting from, from an interstellar point of view. But very recently, uh, Gaurav has done this interesting experiment in UHV. Here is a ruthenium single crystal and you put uh, water and carbon dioxide on the surface and control the conditions, temperature, etc. We do infrared spectroscopy, temperature program, desorption mass spectrometry, low energy ion scattering, secondary ion mass spectrometry, all of these on this chamber at 10 power minus 10 millibar, at 10 Kelvin or seven Kelvin. Uh, and that's the limit of our instrument. But something very interesting happens. So if you put CO2 and H2O, and come in with cesium ions at low energy, 60 EV, this can pick up water from the surface. This is known. Two water it can, pick, can pick up CO2 from the surface, it's a mixture. What is surprising is that you can pick up this carbonic acid from the surface. Only at such low temperatures. And here is 15 Kelvin, you can see this, but you go to higher temperatures, 50 Kelvin, 60 Kelvin, you don't see it at all. So very interesting new aspects are coming in atomically precise clusters and gas hydrates. I'm coming to the end of my talk in a minute to say that there are a lot of challenges and opportunities. Expanding this molecular chemistry to nanoparticles, as I just mentioned to you, is fascinating. Uh, is it possible to detect these dimers, nanoparticle cluster intermediates under a microscope? Can you see them? Observing real chemistry in real time, dynamics of atoms, molecules and clusters is really fascinating. The expanding properties I mentioned to you briefly, the mechanical properties, electrical properties, biological properties, magnetic properties. I know that Professor Sukuda and others are looking at catalytic properties. He has also studied magnetic properties. Many others need to be explored. Observing hydrates in real time, uh, chemistry of these hydrates allow you to explore chemistry in nanoscale cages. All of these will be better understood with computational efforts and with expanding understanding, we reach closer to this chemist dream of engineering matter at, at the atomic scale. So we have several new infrastructure coming into the group and to this larger group that we have. We have a new mass spectrometer taking us to mega Dalton mass spectrometry possible in the next few months. We are installing this machine now. We have a cryo electron microscope through another funding uh, just coming and a new building is coming up at IIT Madras. 
This is to show you that high resolution uh, microscopy can get you structures of ice. So this is the cubic ice uh, detected in carbon nanotube. Uh, so there are several interesting possibilities uh, with such materials. And obviously, therefore, please join us, visit us, stay with us, and uh, let's discover together. This work was done with this exciting team of people. This is a, a couple of years old, and therefore, my uh, dear student, former students are, are here. And some of them have joined. I see Ananya has just joined, and I, I see her here, although she is not here. And this uh, picture was taken when Professor Cooks was uh, visiting us. This work that I just presented uh, is a tip of an iceberg. A lot of people have contributed to this um, and several collaborators are here in this group. And I want to tell you that this subject area is not, this fascination is not because of just me and, and uh, people here. There are many others uh, who have come together in exploring matter at the nanoscale. And this is one such uh, fascinating collection of people at the Gordon Research Conference on clusters. And this work was done by, uh, with the support of Department of Science and Technology, Government of India. Thank you very much. And I'll be glad to take questions. You can unmute yourself and then ask questions. Uh, we have just crossed our, I think, subscription limit. Therefore, people are at 100 and, uh, and others are probably watching this at the YouTube channel. So in case you have questions there, please do uh, post us, post those questions right there and Amog will be in a position to capture those questions and then uh, shoot them. We have uh, maybe if all of you can stay for another 10 minutes, we can take those questions. Thank you. Sir, we have a question in chat box in uh, Zoom itself uh, by Lord Xavier. Yeah, yeah. So uh, if others are there, uh, you can probably unmute as well as uh, um, please ask those questions. Cool crystal images in the TEM, numerous possibilities. Have you tried microelectron diffraction uh, to prove all the structure? So this is uh, uh, micro ED is a very interesting possibility. Uh, and that is something that we need to pursue. And uh, several people are working on this. Papers have just not appeared, but uh, atom reconstruction, there are papers uh, already. And uh, Professor Sukuda is uh, a co author in a paper uh, on, on such themes. But micro ED is certainly a very interesting thing. Thank you, Lourdes. Please go ahead. Hi, Pradeep. Can I ask a question? Thank you. Yes. Is, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the great talk uh, about the uh, big picture about the molecular uh, chemistry on clusters. And I have a small question on you uh, about uh, the complexation uh, system of the clusters. So you talk about the uh, Supra molecular chemistry of between clusters and uh, cyclodextrin. Yes. And uh, could you could you manipulate or modify the properties or stabilities of the clusters by uh, supra molecular chemistry? Uh, very nice question. Um, as you know, people take this uh, largely in the context of biology. Hmm. And their solubility is an important thing. So this can be changed uh, substantially. Uh -huh. Luminescence can be enhanced uh, substantially and that, uh -huh. that, uh, that is useful. Uh, now, stability in environments uh, like mm. the small pH changes, uh, they continue to be stable. Uh, and, and in some cases, we have been in a position to crystallize, mm. but this subject area, uh, more and more clusters have to be probed uh, 
uh, with supramolecular chemistry, mm. but only a few have been investigated so far. Gold 25 and uh, silver 25 mm -hmm. and silver 29. But uh, this variety, as you know, this PMBA and uh, adamantane and all that, a uh, mm -hmm. whole range is possible. And CD is only one of them, but there is cucurbituril and several others, uh, which are host uh, molecules, they need to be pursued too. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Hi, Professor Pradeep. This is Habib. It yes. was a very nice talk. Oh, thank you. Very nice, Habib. Yeah. And uh, in the gold and uh, silver clusters, uh, you showed that there is a kind of single atom substitution in the core. So is there any reason that uh, the, the core atom is substituted with other heteroatom or uh, the ex, the outer atoms in the outer shell also can be a uh, kind of substitute with other heteroatoms. Yes, uh, uh, many uh, atoms have been, your heteroatoms have been used for substitutions. But if you take, let us say, a gold cluster and put silver, silver can go anywhere. Uh, people have put it everywhere. Uh, and uh, let us say gold, silver cluster, you put gold. Yes, that's also preferentially goes to, let us say initially goes to the center, but it goes other places to other places also. Palladium, one go palladium goes only at the center and the second palladium doesn't get in, uh, into this system. And that is because of an unusual stability of that cluster system. Same is the case with uh, platinum as well. Uh, now, so one aspect is stability of these cluster systems, uh, whether it is nickel or palladium or platinum, they prefer to go to the center position because of uh, thermodynamic stability of these systems. Now, as far as gold and copper and uh, silver are concerned, there are multiple uh, sites in which they can uh, go to. But this area is now expanding. Uh, there's more and more clusters coming. Uh, now, one would like to put two nickels, two palladiums, palladium and nickel together. All of these efforts are going on, uh, excepting one atom substitution. Uh, we don't have other uh, results yet. I see, great. And one more question is that, um, uh, how do those gold and silver clusters are stable in solution? Let's say, are they stable for a day or they aggregate over time? They are stable for years together. So you, you can oh, make wow. these materials and keep them. Uh, but then some of them are stable only for a week or two weeks or something. Some others you have to cool them just as molecules. But uh, I have clusters with me for over, let's say, 15 years. In a solution or, or in a solid? Solution as well as solid. Oh, it's it's not that all you. clusters are like that, but some. Oh, I see. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah, great. Good evening, Professor. This is Lakshmi Narasimhan from SIGPI. So it's yes. a wonderful talk of uh, listening to your lecture, or chem your course on chemistry of novel materials long back. Okay. So uh, I have a small uh, question on your platinate system. Yes. So carbonic acid forms only at low temperature, like 15 Kelvin, what do you observe? But as you increase the temperature, is it the stability of the carbonic acid or it's the close proximity of the uh, water and the CO2 which is coming uh, that prevents the reaction? Or what could be the exact uh, reason for this? So carbonic acid has been chased for a long time. I mean, it has been a, a chase uh, for, for what, a century. Huh? Uh, but people have seen carbonic acid at low temperature. Very recently, there is a, a paper. Uh, and uh, some years ago, there was another paper. But nobody has seen carbonic acid at room temperature. Uh, OK. And people have seen carbonic acid at low temperature. But that, too, 
nobody thought that carbonic acid can be present at this kind of 10 Kelvin. And that is what the exciting thing is. And how is it forming is something that uh, we do not know yet. If carbonic acid were to be forming, is it assisted by ice or is it assisted by water? Uh, is it a reaction between one CO2 and one H2O? It actually appears as though that one CO2 and three H2Os make one carbonic acid and these two H2Os subsequently participate in this chemistry such that you get decomposition of this carbonic acid. So the overall system requires minimum of three H2Os. So the details of it are still evasive. Uh, they need greater understanding. Thank you, Professor. In case you have more questions. Uh... Hi, Professor. This is Ramya here. Oh, how are you, Ramya? I'm, I'm good, sir. Uh, great talk. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, this uh, atomic precision that you just talked about, it's, it sounds crazy. I just want to understand how do you control atomically the precise location of uh, placing a gold atom or a silver atom. I mean, you, you mentioned about extremely pure synthesis, but uh, how do you achieve it? I mean, uh, is your group the first to achieve it or there are others and is it a routine thing? Because this sounds like a great thing where you, you have uh, a control at the atomic level. You're, you're able to precisely uh, manipulate it and engineer whatever you want. So how is that done, sir? So this subject, as I just mentioned in the beginning, third or some uh, slide, there are a lot of people and uh, some of those pioneers are right here. So could have first, uh, you know, several of those clusters he made. So there are a lot of people who, who contributed to this area. But today one is one thing is clear that just as you make, let us say, uh, uh, yeah, salicylic acid, or you know, you make uh, paracetamol. How do you make paracetamol? You mix A and B, and then finally you get paracetamol. This kind of synthesis is possible uh, with for metal clusters, and I like to call them as these molecules uh, because. This, this chemistry is similar to the kind of chemistry and using these uh, clusters, we are doing molecular chemistry. Uh, that's what I showed you uh, today, okay. whether it is uh, A plus B reactions or supramolecular chemistry or any such thing, they are molecular. Now your question is, can I take an atom A, uh, an atom B or whatever, do something and make a Toluene equivalent or a benzene yeah. equivalent of, uh, of, of uh, metals. Okay. Yes, it is possible today. Now, this is on, not just gold alone. This is gold with some protection. And the simplest of systems that people have gone to so far is a metal with some hydride. H minus, we don't know really whether it is H minus or not, but it, this metal and hydrogen together, you can get a small piece of metal and hydrogen with atomic precision, with a molecular formula, with a charge, precise charge. Now, take that hydride a little further to a methane thiol or an ethane thiol, these are the kind of molecules that I just showed you. Yeah. They contain the metal with the sulfur, with carbon and hydrogen. And others have shown this, not sulfur is really not required. Uh, you can get, uh, let us say, just carbon and hydrogen alone, uh, like alkynes. Uh, you can get, to simpler systems. 
it is possible to have diversity in them, but it is not possible just as organic chemists do C1, C2, C3, H2, Cn. Today that has not been possible, uh, but there is a whole range uh, of clusters known. Fascinating. Yeah, truly. Thank you, sir. Sir, we have a question uh, from uh, Dr. Karthik Krishna Kumar. In case yes. of alloy nano clusters, what would be the criteria for an for a metal atom among the alloy to occupy core or central position in the crystal structure? That, that is stability, largely to stability. Stability is uh, many aspects of stability: structural stability, there's electronic stability, bonding uh, uh, associated aspects of largely to do with thermodynamic stability of that cluster system. So we if, have, you put, uh, if you put it at the center, yes, you have one energy, you have put it at somewhere else, you have another energy. Uh, well, the reason for that energy is uh, bonding or uh, electronic reasons. Yeah, go ahead, next. Uh, we have another question. Can you please explain about metal cluster chirality which you have shown in your slides? Yeah, so imagine a cluster uh, similar to take this carbon equivalent, you have orientations. So let us say you have a five atom, let us say a ring, which is constituting in this, let us say is present in this cluster. Another five atom ring is below. Let us say that is at a particular rotation, an angle. So if you start looking at these metal atoms present, metal atoms constitute a particular kind of a chiral arrangement. This, uh, their mirror images cannot be superimposed. So such a system obviously is going to be chiral. Now the idea of such chirality is very recent. There are not many examples of such cluster uh, chiral, chiral clusters. And, uh, but then there is also not many examples of extremely stable cluster, uh, chir ch chirally, chiral clusters which are stable. But that's an, a, clearly, these are to do with the arrangements of atoms, uh, producing structures, which are mirror image structures, which are not super impossible. So just as an organic uh, molecule, a chiral organic molecule. Can you get clusters to get chiral molecules from a resin? clusters, you get chiral molecules. Yeah, so this aspect has not been done. You People have used uh, clusters, a mixture of uh, chiralities separated with chiral columns or chiral procedures. So this has been done. Now, chiral clusters, can you separate a racemic mixture of organic molecules? This has, to my knowledge, has not been done because there are other methods available already for organic molecules for this. In fact, that is what is used by, for clusters to separate them. But that's an interesting thought. Can we increase stability using metal organic framework? Surely, I mean, people are looking at uh, cluster-based organic frameworks. Okay, so that's all I think uh, we have we have already taken about uh, 13 minutes more. Uh, we will close this lecture now. Uh, in case there are other questions, please do. Oh, uh, uh, Lourdes, you have written about mega Dalton mass spectrometry, but it is possible to do mega Dalton mass spectrometry, I think. Uh, of, Galton mass spectrometry is being done very well. Viruses and all that have been studied. Um, clusters, uh, we, will, we will get there uh, very soon. Thank you all for joining. Uh, please do um, visit us whenever it is possible. Uh, please write to us and please do attend uh, all the remaining lectures in this series. The next lecture is by Professor Tatsuya Tsukuda uh, on 25th uh, February at the same time. Thank you all.
Thank you, Pradeep. Thank you. Bye.